Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. Today we're talking about Luka Doncic. I know, shocker, right? But the reason we're talking about Luka, not in a post-game context, is because Luka is on the cusp of something really remarkable. Now, we'll see how the MVP voting goes. I see he's made a late charge into the top two. That's awesome. That's great. I still have reservations about whether or not national media finally gives him his flowers that he deserves. But at the very least, he's made his case where he cannot be disputed or argued against. Luca is about to have the first ever 34-9-10 season in NBA history. He's also become a capable defender. Now, he very much feeds off of the team. Like There are moments where he can step up and he can lead. It's when the team is dialed in and there are other guys giving that same energy that he rises to that level. On the defensive end, it's just different. And it's just kind of like, what's your mentality first? He is an offensive mastermind and genius, first and foremost. The defense is secondary. He will rise to that occasion if guided, if motivated. He can at times step up, but in terms of consistent uh, performance, it's very much he feeds off of the, the whole of the team. But with the NBA being such an offensively driven league at this point, that's not shocking. And that's not a problem for him. That's certainly not a deal breaker. So Luca being in this position where now suddenly he's become a good defender, he's allowing just uh, 0.766 points per possession in isolation. And he's seventh in the league in steals. That comes from hero of the day uh, on Twitter. So, and yes, I'm saying Twitter. I refuse to say X. So that's where Raluca is right now. And when you consider the amount of injuries and everything that his team has had around him, him playing banged up at times, it's really hard to say otherwise. He leads the league in 35 plus point games. The next closest is Giannis. And Giannis is like fairly comfortably behind him, like double digit games behind him in that category, I believe. So it's, it's really a, a powerful statement here that he is an offensive mastermind. He has powered the Mavericks to what looks to be, I mean, it is right now. We'll see how it winds down this final week, but looks to be a top five record in the West. If he were in the East, that would be good for the two seed. Like it's a staggeringly different perception. If you want to write him off and say like, oh, well, they're fifth in the West. That's, ah, I don't know about giving the MVP to a guy that's not a home court advantage, you know, leverage there it didn't matter in the past when you gave it to Jokic when Jokic got an MVP once they were the sixth seed so that doesn't matter do the stats matter do, does the history and the context matter what about the actual performances and you know you know context if you look at all of this and the total number of games the Mavericks starters have missed they lead the West by a comfortable margin in terms of collective time missed Teams like the Thunder, T-Wolves, Nuggets, you know, the top of the West right now, they have been so overwhelmingly healthy this year. That's the big difference between them and a team like Dallas. I'm not saying, hands down, Dallas is better than any of those three teams. I'm saying, other than maybe the Nuggets, I don't think they're in a different category. I think the Mavericks, healthy, are in the same category in conversation as the T-Wolves, as the Thunder. And I think they could give a, a puncher's chance with the Nuggets. However, when I look at the perception and the conversation around these teams, all I see is just slander for Luka. And I think there's a multitude of things behind it. Uh, part of it could be that he's a European player. There's still some of that there, not near as much as there used to be, but there is still some bias against that sort of thing. Also, the fact that Luca is, uh, you know, the nickname at times, Luca Don Thick, a little bit uh, barrel chested, let's say. That as well, I think, plays into it and the perception, assumption. Now, Jokic, similar thing, I know. But for whatever reason, Jokic doesn't face as much of that. Now that he's had the team success, especially, he'll never face it. And there's no, there's no arguing either of these guys' greatness. But it's interesting to me that one of them feels like he's been hounded by that the entirety of his career in the NBA. And the other guy had it in stretches, but never as loud. And then it's like he finally got over that hilltop. And now nobody says a word about it. And it's like Luca, 
getting to the West Finals, like he did that one run, didn't change that conversation. That's interesting that the conversation did not shift there. And we went right back to the next season talking about like, Luca not good enough. Luca's not going to be able to take this team to that. He's not an MVP caliber guy. He's not blah, blah, blah. And you get just brain dead opinions. And, and again, I don't like giving, I'm not even going to use their names, but I don't like giving attention or credence to people that make just lazy shock jock takes designed only to get engagement. People riled up and mad, whether it's people who hate those guys and are like, yeah, he sucks or yeah, he's overrated. Or it's the people who are on the other side that are passionate fans of these guys stands, if you will, who are going to put these guys on blast and say like, you're a moron. How could you ever make that comparison? Such as, I don't know, maybe calling Luka Doncic, Carmelo Anthony with a three point shot. Stylistically. And in terms of overall game and style could not be a stupider point you could try to make, but guess what? That's the point. They want engagement. These aren't actual, these aren't actual analysts or commentators. All they are are shock jocks. They're just trying to get people riled up and sharing their clips. Their ratings don't even matter. As long as what they say burns like a wildfire on social media, they're getting their way. They're earning their value. So the best way to make these people go away is to not use their names, not share their clips, and just, just say stupid like they say something cool that's a really stupid thing to say moving on to an actual conversation i keep trying to tell people like don't engage with these certainly don't comment on their feet uh, on their feeds don't share or quote tweet what they're saying even if you're trying to dunk on them in the con uh, in the context of it it doesn't it doesn't help you it doesn't help the broader discussion it only helps them and it keeps these people who suck at their job in positions of influence. And then you got other guys who actually vote on the MVP award, making terrible cases like, oh, I would give the award to Jalen Brunson or to this guy or to this guy before I would give it to Luca. And it's like, there is no, there is no argument to be made where you can look at it and say, this makes sense. That is a sound argument. It's lazy. These people are spoon fed the stats and the little nuggets of information that they read on their shows. And they still suck at their job because when it gets to the 5% of the time, they have to actually say what they think and just riff on what they're saying. They can't even do that effectively because they immediately put their foot in their mouth and remove any legitimacy to any argument that they've been making. So don't listen. You know, there, there's a thing when Luca drops 73 points and it's crickets. It's either crickets or it's people actually criticizing the state of the game or Luca's performance itself as if somehow it wasn't remarkable. But when it's Joel and B dropping 70, when it's Devin Booker dropping 70, uh, when it's Jalen Brunson going for like 60 or whatever, these are all rave worthy. Like there's a weird bias and perception against Luca. And I think part of it is, a little bit of his own moxie and attitude, a little bit of it is his, uh, the way that he'll look for calls, the way he'll bicker with referees, get these technicals and really comes across as unlikable to outside fan bases. That absolutely plays a part in that perception. I know he doesn't care about it. I wish he would tone it down a little bit, but at the same time with everything else, as great as it is, as long as it's not costing you in an absolute key moment, you kind of just have to take the good with the bad. You can say like, hey, I want you to work on this, but you can't realistically say, oh, we need to completely eliminate this from it. Um, it's just not reasonable. You're getting so much of everything else you could possibly want that to nitpick in these areas it is almost like greedy, I guess. You want it. You're probably not going to get it to the extent that you want it though. So just enjoy what you got. So the whole point is like, the conversation and the, the goalposts constantly move. The conversation is not an earnest or legitimate one. It's always meant to be antagonistic. It's always meant to be revisionist or just straight up gaslighting you. If he's able to climb into the MVP conversation, that is sensational. That is otherworldly. 
because of the amount of criticism and everything else that he faces. The perception that he's having to try to override is staggeringly steep. Despite his greatness, despite his own talent, because they want to look at everything. They want to say like, oh, people used to say he had no talent. But look, Kristaps Porzingis has been great with the Celtics. He was still good with the Wizards. He got away from Dallas and immediately everything was better. Oh, really? He got away from Luka. Yeah, I get it. KP just got uh, Eastern Conference Player of the Week alongside Kyrie Irving. I just did a video on that, uh, getting it for the West. Cool. Kudos to KP. KP, by his own admission, had a little bit of an ego clash with Luka because KP wasn't quite ready to give up that notion of being the guy. He's accepted and stepped into a role now with the Celtics, and it fits. There were stretches where he kind of did that for Dallas. On, on the surface, what we saw, it was working. Behind the scenes, not as much so. Jalen Brunson, his usage rate is staggeringly high. So he's gone, and yeah, he just had like a 60-point game, but he did it on 47 shots, which is the most shots since Kobe's final game for a single player to take. Like, no disrespect to Brunson. Love Jalen Brunson. Really wish we had somehow held on to him. But Jalen Brunson was never going to be the Jalen Brunson we see today staying in Dallas. And that's not because Luka was blocking him or anything like that. Really, if anything, it was just that last stretch and the postseason where we finally started to see what that one-two punch could be. But the difference is that JB never got paid. A Kyrie Irving, for instance, is 30. He came to Dallas when he was like 30, 31 years old. He's 32 now. Had already won championships. Had already had an extended, decorated career should have been an all uh all 75 team for the nba really that was just the the politics and everything around him that kind of kept him out of that conversation even still it's a different place in his career where he is and he's still doing that one one a role with luca i think if jb had stayed he still could have gotten paid very handsomely even though dallas absolutely fumbled that so many times through but you could have had still a very, very capable, not as high of a ceiling, like in the immediacy. I'm talking like this next, like this year and maybe like one or two more years beyond this before I think that window for this duo is done. Because I think the Kyrie drop off will happen by the time he's hitting 34, obviously years old, uh, 34, 35. So with Brunson, yeah, you might have had a, a larger window, but I don't think it was going to be as high of a ceiling as I'm really sticking with this house analogy here. So Luca faces those criticisms like, oh, people said he never played with anybody. But look, he, he had all three or they had this trio right here. And what did they get with it? Well, they got nothing out of the first round until KP was gone and they brought in some defensive help. And that allowed them to then elevate for a deep playoff run. Then by the time they made the move last year to try and recalibrate after losing Brunson, they gutted themselves defensively and in terms of their athleticism. And so suddenly they had nothing to get there. So I don't even blame the end of the season last year for that. I, I think that's a lazy argument. These are people who only watch box scores. These are people who only look at what the broader narrative is and then go out there and parrot it as if they're actually analyzing and studying what's happening. I get that. I get that it's lazy. I get that that's, you know, for, for people making the money that they make doing this, it's it's uh, wild. It's one thing for somebody to say like, oh, this YouTube guy hasn't watched every single game and can't comment on every little piece of it. That's fine. Is the YouTube guy making hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars? I certainly don't think so. Certainly haven't seen it. So it's a different conversation. It's a different level of scrutiny that Luca in particular seemingly has to overcome and his his co-star health picture never comes into the conversation and people will try and brush away his historic performances or his offensive explosions and saying like yeah but look at his usage rate of course you got those points look how much they're using them if he's missing all of his teammates if he's missed more time the Mavericks have of their starting lineup this year than any other relevant team in the West by a country mile, no less. 
and you're going to say like, okay, well, Luca's here. How is he going to hold them up? How is he going to elevate them? How are they going to hang in and keep their season going before the wheels fall off early in the year because they were so beat up early on? He's probably going to have to do more scoring. He's probably going to have to carry a bigger burden with him. But rather than actually follow the dots from one to the next, connecting the dots, they just drop back and say like, ah, let me dismiss it in just a straw man way. It's lazy, man. It's lazy. Now Luca here, <laughs> and now as I finally get to the reason I was actually making this video, the, the cool stat and that I wanted to share from Lando Thomas is that Luka Doncic is now 29 points away from passing Mark Aguirre for first on the Mavericks all-time list for points scored in a single season. Not career, single season. I First of all, I was still amazed that wasn't a Dirk record just because seemingly every other Mavericks record is a Dirk-owned record. But uh, Mark Aguirre does currently hold the record for most points in a single season for the Mavericks with 2,300 30. Luca with a week left in the season is 29 points away. I'm going to say it's a good chance he gets it because they're going to, I mean, if they give him a rest game, it's going to be like the final game of the season at most two. But I really think they're probably going to have to play him through and 29 points. That's a single game. That's a single outing. Even if he's on low gear mode at most, that's two games away. So yeah. Luca's on the cusp again of owning another staggering record. One of the few Maverick records Dirk somehow never claimed himself. So, yeah, you, you consider the fact that he's what year five, year six in Dallas at this point, and he's already doing this. That's incredible. Like from an age perspective, he's just now starting to touch his prime. Some people debate and argue, which is kind of a pointless argument and discussion, but about whether or not he's already in his prime just because he went pro so young. Fair argument, but from a body's physical standards, usually we usually talk about a prime window being from like 25 to 33. 33 is pushing the back end of it. That was Dirk's championship run when he absolutely peaked in that playoff run. But still, it's, it's around that time now uh, where Luca should just be touching that window. Maybe you say he's a couple years ahead, so maybe he's in the middle of his prime, but it's still the front part of his prime, the front portion. It's incredible that he's already claiming records like this. It's incredible that we're talking about him and looking at the picture of this could be a legitimate MVP season here. Whether or not he gets it, it it's absolutely fair to say that, like, He's deserving of it. Whether he gets it, that's a separate conversation. It feels like he's always going to battle those kind of criticisms. And honestly, it's kind of hard to imagine. We say this regularly, I feel like, but it's kind of hard to imagine him continuing to climb year over year, getting better. Now, he has done that in every single season he's come back. He has gotten better with each passing season because he just works in the offseason on whatever his weaknesses were. When he got when uh, Kawhi cooked them in the first round, the first time he went to the playoffs, I say cooked them. They lost in six that first go around. Uh, and Kawhi just destroyed them in the mid range game. Luca came back the next year with a sudden, with a suddenly like very adept, solid mid range game. They had another battle, went to seven, and that was kind of like a war of attrition because of the supporting cast just not being where Dallas needed it to be contingent. Well, now they've got the team around him. I know the Clippers in terms of individual talent are better than those teams were as well, but I don't think Kawhi, Kawhi is still Kawhi, but I don't think Kawhi is in the same category now that he was, you know, a few years ago. So you just got to see, it's going to be a fascinating battle, but you do kind of wonder like, okay, if Dallas holds a top five seed and Lucas sets these records and does all of this, do they go with a, what would it be three MVPs for Jokic at that point? Or are we looking more? I honestly, I usually don't pay that much attention to the MVP to be perfectly honest. Um, but this year, obviously more invested because Luca has been at least in terms of deservedness, even when he wasn't in the conversation, when it made all the sense in the world for him to at least be in that top three, top five discussion, 
he's finally in position now as the season's winding down that he should be there. Are, are we, whether we go with another Jokic reign as MVP or Luca finally gets the, the credit and recognition that he deserves, we'll see. But the bigger story, and I think Luca would tell you this as well, the bigger story is do the Mavericks slay the dragon and beat the Clippers in the playoffs? That is, you know, Jordan had to go through the Pistons. LeBron had to go through the Celtics. Granted, he ran away to another team to make it happen. But still, you have these roadblocks that you have to get through sometimes, even for great players. This will be an interesting challenge for Luca as we talk about changing that broader surrounding narrative and perspective. So we'll see. But let me know in the comments. One, do you think Luca is going to finally get over the hump and win MVP? Do you think that it's already a foregone conclusion, essentially, that it's a Jokic winner winner here and no disc discredit or taking anything away from him? He's absolutely deserving as well. But I know that sometimes voters get bored with voting the same guy all the time. It's why Jordan didn't have like eight or nine MVPs. But even still, who do you think wins MVP? Do you think that Luca can continue to ascend even higher yet? Is he already at his peak and we're just riding this wave? Or is there still slightly further maybe he can climb? Let me know in the comments. Like the video. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!